before we begin today's sermon, a couple of comments to make. We seem to be living in a time where COVID-19 has just kind of taken over our lives. But there are some reminders that COVID-19 hasn't quite taken over every aspect of our lives. For one thing, the church liturgical calendar goes on. Next week is Palm Sunday. Today is a Sunday in Lent. Two weeks from today will be Easter Sunday. COVID-19 doesn't have anything to do about that. And there's another thing that it doesn't have anything to do about, and that's our hope. Our hope is in our faith. Yesterday, someone shared with me a piece of hope. You will hear or read more about this story this coming week in the scoop, so watch for that. I'm not going to steal all of the thunder, but I do want to share a couple pieces of hope blooming outside our church, right on schedule, the jonquils and the crocuses. COVID-19 doesn't have anything to do with when the flowers bloom. They're going to bloom right on schedule and spring is going to come. The birds are going to build nests and they're going to start singing. Life goes on. The fact that life goes on is a testimony to our faith. And in that faith is our hope. We are all going to come through this mess and we will all gather again in this sanctuary and we will all praise God. And for that, we need to give a very big prayer of thanks. And now join me in prayer. Oh Lord, we do give you thanks for you are indeed the source of our hope. You are also the one who opens our hearts, who opens our spirits to hear your word. And so we ask now that you would help us to hear through your word and through this message, the words that you would have each of us to hear from you. In Christ we pray, amen. As I said, this is still Lent, and I know a lot of pastors are setting aside Lenten sermons and preaching just messages of hope right now to get us all through. My hope is that you're going to remember the pictures of the jonquils and the crocuses, and we are going to continue life as usual and focus on Lent. The, this morning, we jump to Matthew's account of what happened for Jesus right after his arrival in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Next week, we will consider his actual arrival into Jerusalem. To set the stage for the scripture passage, Jesus had entered Jerusalem knowing that he was going to die. He knew his ministry was coming to an end, and he knew what lay before him. In other words, he knew that this was going to be one very stormy week for him. The fact that Jesus went immediately to the temple, the most holy place for the Jewish people, as soon as he entered Jerusalem is very understandable and really rather predictable. There is nothing unusual about going to a place of worship when life's storms hit. Jesus needed to find a place where reverent worship was taking place. But that is not what he found when he walked in. Listen to Matthew 21, 12 through 15. I'm sorry, 12 through 13. 
Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> when we think about the temple that Jesus entered, we need to consider two ways in which it was different from the Protestant sanctuaries in which we worship today. First, it was a pilgrimage destination for Jews from all over the world. And second, it was a place where animal sacrifice was practiced in accordance with the Jewish rites established by the laws of Moses. These two features also distinguish it from the synagogues in the small towns. Synagogues were places of learning. People went to synagogues on the Sabbath, a bit like we go to church, come into the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. There were songs of praise, readings from the scrolls, a sermon, and prayers. But sacrifices were not offered in synagogues. The temple in Jerusalem was the place where sacrifices were offered to God. They were made both privately for individuals and corporately for all the people. When Joseph and Mary presented Jesus to the Lord in the temple, those few days after he was born, they sacrificed two doves according to the command of Jewish law. Other sacrifices, such as thanksgiving and blessing sacrifices, were also made on the altar for all people. Prayer offered by the priests accompanied the sacrifice. They asked God for forgiveness for the people, and they thanked God for blessings. The slain animal did not, in and of itself, provide forgiveness. God saw the remorse and the true repentance of people, and God gave forgiveness. But somehow over the years, the practice of sacrifice had become more of a business and sometimes an opportunity to gather for a feast. There were different kinds of sacrificial offerings. In the case of sin offerings, only the animal's fat burned and the flesh was given to the priests to eat. But in peace offerings and thanksgiving offerings, the meat was given to the people to eat. There was merriment in the feast of eating the meat. Pieces of meat could be taken to family members or friends, and friends did not even need to understand what the sacrifice was all about or even be members of the Jewish faith. To get the significance of Jesus entering the temple as soon as he had entered Jerusalem, remember that he entered Jerusalem knowing that he was going to be the sacrifice for all human sin. All people were to benefit from his sacrifice. All people were to be spiritually fed by it. Surely there was no more solemn and reverent purpose for entering the temple where sacrifices were made to God on behalf of the people. But when Jesus arrived at the temple, he was met with the businesses associated 
with sacrifice. Jews from all over the world had come to the temple to celebrate Passover. As part of the observance of Passover, they purchased animals to be sacrificed. They came from all different countries and with all different currencies, just like we have to exchange U.S. dollars for British pounds or euros, people had to exchange their currencies for temple currencies. The money changers were exchanging the different currencies for temple currencies, but they were doing it a little bit dishonestly. They were not giving the people as much temple currency as they were supposed to. They were pocketing the rest. Jesus saw the dishonesty associated with the sacrifice. In other words, the sacred temple where Jesus sought reverence and homage being paid to God, he instead saw a place where business was conducted dishonestly for the purpose of making money and where lambs were sacrificed for the purpose of feasting. The religious meaning of sacrificing a living creature had been totally lost. The Son of God, about to make the supreme sacrifice for all people, this attitude must have been disappointing and hurting beyond all measure. To give your life for someone who attaches no meaning to your sacrifice robs life of all meaning. God the Father had decreed that this temple would be built. It was to have been a place where people could come into God's presence and worship Him. It was to have been a place where people were spiritually connected to God. It was to have been a place where they left the matters and cultural concerns of daily living outside and entered a place where they were on a different plane of existence, one in which their attention was focused on God and God's commandments. Instead, the people simply dragged the marketplace right into the temple with them. They replaced the reverent worship of God with making money dishonestly and making merry with their friends. Little wonder Jesus became angry and drove them all out. Was there no one who appreciated the importance and meaning of sacrifice? Was there no one for whom God was a divine presence worthy of worship in that temple? Would no one value the sacrifice Jesus was about to make? These questions remain appropriate for us today. We live in a time when there are those for whom the church is just one more philanthropic or social organization where people can come and do good works. There are some others for whom it is a place to come and be uplifted, to feel better. 
while these are all worthy side effects of worship, they fall short of being the main purpose for which we enter the sanctuary. What are our reasons for coming into the sanctuary? In our time, is the worship of the divine presence of God the focal point of being in the sanctuary? On Communion Sundays, is our sin and the need for Christ's atonement the focal point of our presence in the sanctuary? Do we come into the sanctuary to connect with God through prayer or to connect with each other through shared interests and common experience? If Jesus walked into our sanctuary or sat in on our meetings, which by the way, he does, would he find a need to drive out motives and interests not in keeping with a house of prayer? Would he find self-interest to be a problem for us in the way that it was a problem for those that he drove out of the temple the day he arrived? Lent is a time for self-examination, and it is appropriate for these questions to be a part of our corporate examination. The importance we've placed on prayer during Lent is directly tied to the importance that Jesus placed on prayer. We have explored how and where we pray against the backdrop of Jesus' instructions to pray in spirit and in truth, and to pray in a room with the door closed. The focus of our prayers is not on ourselves and our own wants and needs. The focus is on our connection with God. Today's sermon passage tells us that Jesus does not want our prayer life to be limited to that room with a door closed. Prayer is the main reason we gather in the sanctuary together to worship. We still go to God in prayer and ask forgiveness and to express thanks. But we no longer sacrifice animals we know that our Lord is our sacrifice and that we are in Christ and that Christ's sacrifice provides for our forgiveness. Together, we make up the body of Christ on earth prayer that connects us to the Spirit of Christ is the heart of the body. Through prayer, we worship God and are given love, grace, peace, hope, and joy that we share with each other and all those God would add to the body so that it grows. Through prayer, we supply support, strength, courage, peace, and comfort to people who are suffering. As we come to the end of the Lenten season, let us resolve to continue finding time in our busy schedules to be alone with God in prayer. And let us have the courage to look 
at our corporate worship and a determination to eliminate any attitudes or practices that offend our Lord. For our Lord enters into our sanctuary and into our services every Sunday morning. Then let us pray together the prayers that God would have us pray, the prayers that God will use to bring God's kingdom to earth. Amen.